1 John chapter 2, we're going to look at three little verses this morning, uh, verse 12 through 14. So we'll be here about six, seven hours. Well, they don't call me breath and britches for nothing, okay? That's not funny. 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 through 14, we're going to study on this topic this morning, a letter of encouragement, a letter of of encouragement. First John chapter 2, look at verse 12 through verse 14. Would you read silently as I read aloud from God's precious word this morning? The Bible says, I write unto you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his namesakes. John says, I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is God that is from the beginning. And I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. Uh, because you have, and I write unto you little children, because you have known the Father. And I have written unto you fathers, because you have known him that is uh, from the beginning. And I have written unto you young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that there is encouragement in the word of God. And God, I would pray this morning that this little morsel, this golden nugget from the book of 1 John would bring encouragement to us in our lives because we are all in different stages of our spiritual walk. And Father John addresses children and young men and fathers. He addressed spiritually immature, but yet those who are, are saved, babies in Christ. He addressed those who have studied the word and have become a little stronger in their spiritual life. And he addressed fathers, those who may be teachers or, or spiritual leaders. And he encourages them. So, Father, I pray that you would encourage us by your Holy Spirit today as we seek to see the Father, as we seek his Son, your Son, Jesus Christ. So we avail ourselves, Lord God, to your Holy Spirit to lead God and direct through this time of study of your Word. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Thank you. Would you be seated? Everyone needs encouragement. When's the last time you can say that somebody just really encouraged you to pieces? Or just encouraged you? Not a hand up in the whole sanctuary. Miss Irma is a great encouragement to you, brother. You need to thank God. Every day. Every day. Sometimes every hour. Okay, I'm waiting on Miss Irma to say the same, but she hasn't said anything. <laughs> and Ronnie's laughing about that. But you know, so very often we get more discouragement than we do encouragement. And even, you know, in life we have those times where there are folks who come in with their problems and their difficulties or they get angry or they, and, and it always seems to be discouragement. And I appreciate even Ms. Irma this morning asking me how my week has been. And that was an encouragement to me. And, and, um, but even in God's words, sometimes it seems like it's always pounding upon us. And, and um, God has an infinite loving way to sometimes bring encouragement, even when, when he seems like he may be chastising us. In our study of the book of 1 John in chapter 2 here, we saw last Sunday morning where it talked about evidence of knowing Christ. And that is when we are obedient to his word that we show that we really do love him. And last Sunday night, the sermon title was about evidence of not knowing Christ. And one of the key factors of not knowing Christ or not knowing God is if that we have hatred in our heart. Because if you hate, how can you hate the, the brother whom you have seen and say you love the God whom you haven't seen? You can't do that. And then John, through the Holy Spirit, turns this thing and makes it a letter of encouragement. And first, he writes unto children. And we see that in verse 12 and also somewhat in verse 13 where he says, I write unto you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. And in the last part of verse 13, he says, And I write unto you little children because you have known the Father. He writes to the little ones. These are, are babies in Christ, those who are spiritually immature because they haven't, they haven't necessarily grown in Christ. And he reiterates to them, he says, I write unto you because you're forgiven. That tells me that he's talking about believers. He's talking about Christians. They are, are, are in Christ. And, and he says unto them, he says, your sins are forgiven. And the word sins there is plural. He's not saying a particular sin is forgiven, but he's saying your sins are forgiven. You see, when you become a child of God, 
Every sin that you have ever committed, every sin you might commit uh, or are committing today or might commit in the future, every sin as far as salvation goes is absolutely forgiven. You are no longer under the wrath of God, being separated from God for eternity. Now you are under grace and you are a child of the living God and your sins are forgiven. Now that, now I'm talking about salvation. That means you are no longer going to be displaced to a devil's hell. Now your place of eternity will be in God, with God in heaven's glory. Now that does not mean there's not repercussion for sins, okay? There are repercussions when we do things that are wrong. God said he chastens those whom he loves. Uh, we understand that if you run a red light and a police officer pulls you over and gives you a ticket, that is the repercussion for the sin of running that red light, the breaking of the law. It's not talking about that. It's talking about sins of our salvation. But notice in what the scripture says that our sins, plural, are forgiven past, present, and future. And when we kind of have this misnomer, we feel like God forgives us because of who we are, but he does it. He forgives us because of who he is. Matter of fact, if you look at the scriptures, he says your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Not for us. We are the benefactor of it, but he forgives our sins for his glorification to prove that he is almighty God who has the ability to forgive sins. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he said thy sins are forgiven, remember the Judaizers would come up against him and they would say, well, who do you think you are? Are you God? And he'd say, well, yeah. And they couldn't understand that. But he was God, always will be God. And the sins are forgiven for his namesake. If he forgives us of all of our sins, according to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he being God is faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He does that for his namesake to show how wonderful and mighty and awesome he is. Not how wonderful and mighty and awesome we are. Why? Why? Because we'll turn around and sin again, and we'll sin again, and we'll sin again. And he sits there in heaven's glory and says, I forgive them because I love them. I forgive them so much that I sent my son to die for them. And he says, he said, I write unto you little children that you understand your sins are forgiven for my name's sake. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11, the Bible says this, And such were some of you, but ye are washed and you are sanctified, but now you are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of the living God, for his glory and honor, be it we become the benefactors from that. So the Holy Spirit of God is using John after he's already told them that we need to keep his commandments and we have an advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our propitiation, our sin sacrifice. And that if we have hatred in our heart, we really don't know God. But if we really do know him, we need to understand that our sins are forgiven. I had someone ask me Wednesday about the service Sunday night about hatred. And the question arose, well, if I, if I, if I hated someone, should I go talk to them? And I said, was it a habitual hatred? Do you still hate them or did you just dislike or hate what they were doing? There's a difference. We need to be able to separate that. And when we can separate that and realize we don't really hate the person, we just hate what they're doing, that doesn't mean that we're separated from God for eternity. It doesn't mean we're lost. It means even as God hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. So as little children, we need to understand that, that this is written because we're forgiven and also because we know him. We're children of the living God. Notice in verse, uh, verse 3 it says, And hereby we do know him, uh, we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. This is written because we know him. That's what the Word of God, did you know the Word of God is not written to non believers? It's written to believers. Why? Because non believers don't understand it. Non believers don't want to know this is what brings them to know. That Jesus is Lord. But the Word of God is written to us as, a, uh, as an encouragement so it can teach us how to live, how to be, and what we're gaining in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. In, in John chapter, 14, excuse me, chapter 10 and verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known of mine. We know him. I know my Savior. I want to know more of my Savior. I want to know him in the fullness and glory of who he is, but I know that Jesus is my God. And when you become a little uh, a child of God, when you become born again in Christ, that means you have come to know him as being the son of the living God, our advocate, our propitiation, our sin sacrifice. 
So when John writes to the presence of the Holy Spirit, he writes to them because they're forgiven and because they know God. Jesus says in John chapter 10 and verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. In John here, 2 John chapter 2 verse 13, he says, I write unto you little children because you have known the Father. And remember what Jesus told the, uh, the folks that he, he talked to? He says, if you know me, you know the Father. And he also said, if you know the Father, you know me. Because they're one. One in the same. Oh, my dear friends. Many out here from my voice, you may be considered little children. You may not have grown to spiritual maturity yet, but I want you to understand that you don't have to fret about sin if it's under the blood of Christ. You're forgiven. And you're forgiven for his name's sake, not for your because of who you are, not out of works or, or what you have or what you can accomplish. You're forgiven simply because of who Jesus is. And secondly, I want you to understand you're, that, that you're his little children. You know him. Babies know their parents, don't they? Brother Nick brought Zach into the nursery this morning. Had that baby so upset, <laughs> crying his little heart out, and all he wanted was Daddy. He knows his daddy. He knows his mama. He knows his grandfather. Okay, Claude, he knows his granddaddy. He knows his grandmama. Claude's over here. What about me? He didn't even give me a second look, did he? I'm nothing but the preacher. Now, he did go to Grandmama Irma, too, now. Just saying. But little children know. It's a genuine love affection that they have. And as a child of the living God, you should know Jesus. You should know God. He knows you. So John writes that as a letter of encouragement. He says, he says be encouraged. You're forgiven. Be encouraged. You know him. And then he writes into the fathers, quote, teachers or leaders. And he says there in verse 13 and also in verse 14, he says, I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. And then he says in verse 14, I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. Now wait a minute, he just said that. He repeated himself. And I got looking at that and I was wondering, why did he say the same thing to the fathers? I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. And I got thinking about us old people. Sometimes they got to tell us twice. That's not funny, <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> Sometimes people got to say it twice so we get it. But if you break it down, you would see that he writes unto the fathers, the teachers, and the leaders because first they know him. Just as a child of God, he wants them to remember that they are still children of the living God. You never get past that even in your age. My mom's out here. Y'all know my mom. My mom... I'm almost, I'm, I'll be 57 in a few months. And my mom still treats me like a child. No, I'm very mature for my age. What I've always told you that, you know, when you, when you get older and you get married and you have a family, your dad kind of moves out of the position of father and becomes a friend, but your mom's always your mom. She'll jack you up in Walmart in front of God and everybody. She don't care how old you are. They think of you as a child because they know you. And I don't know if y'all got the newsletter article from the Savannah Baptist Association that I wrote this past month uh, uh, in May about uh, Mother's Day. And I put in there about my mom. I've got a godly mom. But our discussions and talks are somewhat different because I'm not only her mom, I'm her pastor. Now you want to get into a different realm of life you try to tell your mom who still looks at you as a six-year-old boy that you're her pastor and she's going to do this. Have, does the phrase lead balloon come to mind? It doesn't seem to get off the ground. But it's different. She knows me. And the Holy Spirit uses John to write into the fathers, the teachers, because they have a personal relationship with God. And he wants to reiterate that, and he does. He says, you need to understand that you have a good relationship with the Father, and you also have a better understanding of him than a baby in Christ or someone who is uh, maybe in the middle of the road. You're a teacher. You're a leader. 
And you need to continue to grow because they're going to grow. And if you don't continue to grow, they're going to pass you in your spiritual walk. So John says, go all the way back. You've been, you've been one of mine since the beginning. From the beginning, you've known him. You're not a beginner in this. So as an encouragement, he says, he writes it to them because you know God and also you have known him from the beginning. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6, it speaks of a pastor not being a novice. At least he be lifted up with pride and fall into condemnation of the devil. There has to come that time of spiritual maturity. Now, I, I know that I'm, I'm almost 57, and I know that I do have the tendency to be childlike. I really do. I love humor, and I can be, but I'll tell you something. When I stand up here, I want you to understand that I'm a mature believer in Christ. Amen. Very mature. I know the Word of God, not implicitly like, like other people might, but I know the Word of God. I spent ample time studying. I'm prepared when I come to the pulpit because I have a great responsibility as a leader, as a pastor, teacher, to share the truth of God's word with you in such a way that you can understand it. And in a gamut of people, that means I have to take it from where a child can understand it to someone who has spiritual maturity can understand it. There's got to be meat on the bone. So there's a whole lot more to this than just standing up and bringing a message. But I'm able to do so because I know the Father. And I've known him for a long time. It's called spiritual maturity. And we need to be encouraged about that. And John also writes unto young men. Notice there in 13 and 14. He says, I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. And I write unto you little children because you have known the Father. And in verse 14 in the middle of the paragraph, he says, I write unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. He writes to those who have some spiritual maturity. They're not babies in Christ. They're not drinking on the middle of the word, milk of the word. They're eating of the meat, but they haven't grown to great spiritual maturity to be teachers yet. It's talking about the middle of the road. And he says, I write unto you because you have overcome the wicked one. In other words, you've got victory in your life, and you understand where that victory comes from. You have known God. Uh, you have, have grown in God. And now you understand that the victory, forgiveness of sins, is for his namesake, not your namesake. That's spiritual maturity. And you understand that the Word of God says that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So you are victorious. Victorious. Young babies don't always feel victorious. They get defeated by the least little things. I know I was thrown off on Brother Nick, but when Brother Nick was leaving Zach in the, in the nursery, he felt defeated. I, I'm lost. My daddy's leaving me. But see, our fathers never leave us. Nick stood out in the, in the hallway and cried. No, he didn't. He said he'd go, go man him up. And God does that with us also. It's called spiritual maturity, realizing that he never does leave us. He doesn't forsake us. He may not, he, we may think he's out of sight and out of mind, but he never is. And if we realize that, we will overcome the wicked one. We have the right to say to Satan, you're a loser, you're a liar. I belong to the king of glory. I am his. I am victorious. And in doing that, we become strong. John writes to the young believers and he says unto them, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you because you have become strong and the word of God abideth in you. They know who their power source is. People who are spiritually mature realize that we can't, but he can. Spirit, people who are spiritually mature realize that our power is in him and, and, and what it says in Philippians 4, 13, that we can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. He's our power source. When we go out in our own resolve, that's when we get beat up and maligned and belittled. But when we go out in the power of God, I like what the old pastor said, we could go against hell with a water pistol. We could mount up a charge against the doors of Satan and hell. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19 says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his power? God empowers us, and we have the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in us. Why do we fret? Why do we worry? Why do, we need to keep growing and going and growing and going. Why? Because his word abides in us. The very word of God lives in our lives. If, if God is God, 
and Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and Jesus is the living word, and the essence of Christ is the Holy Spirit that indwells within us, then his word abides in us. And friends, even the, even the psalmist says that his word was a lamp unto our, his feet and a light unto his path that he may not sin against God. Oh, friends, we need to understand that the word of God is in us. The problem is getting the word of God out of us. So other people can hear it. But not only lives in us, it remains in us. Satan can't take it out. You know, God gave us a, a, an instrument to use, and it's called a memory. And it's amazing how great our memories are. Case in point, as illustration. Have you ever been riding down the road, listening to the radio, and a song come on from way back when? I'm talking about way back when. And you knew all the words to it? Don't listen to them songs. <laughs> but it's amazing how as, as, as children and youth, we, we heard those songs of whatever music genre you used to listen to, and you know those, they're filed back there somewhere, and then out in the blue they come out, and you not only sing it, some of y'all know the dance to it. But isn't it amazing how when we learn the Word of God, and God brings it back to memory, because that Word remi remains in us, it abides in us, I cannot tell you how many times I've quoted scriptures that I didn't even realize I knew. I've shared factual things of God's word, and, and even in my prayer time last night I, as I was praying about, about the message this morning, thanking God that, that he has used me as a counsel in so many different times, and, and the wisdom and instruction that flows because I know the word, I knew, know the word of God. You read it, you study it, and sometimes I may not be able to quote the book, chapter, and verse, but I can tell you the premise of what it says because it remains in me. Here, here, mind and heart. So when John is writing to these young men, he says, you know, you have overcome the wicked one. I'm writing to you because you are strong. I'm writing to you because the word of God abides in you. And he writes again because you've overcome the wicked one. He reiterates it. We're not losers. We are victorious. He wants them to be encouraged. And I want you to be encouraged. As a child of the living God, we've got it made. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy in this world, but one day we're going to bypass this world, shoot right on through the heavens or uh, through the universe and end up in God's heaven's glory, a place called Beulah Land, a place called absolute perfection, a place where eye cannot, has not seen or ear heard, neither has it entered to the heart of man what God has really prepared of us. It's called home. And one day we're going there. Friend, let me tell you, from the infancy of a child of God to a spiritual maturity as a teacher, we still need to be encouraged that we're not fighting for victory, we're fighting from victory, that we need to understand that God is on our side, that God is in us, that nothing can defeat us, we can't lose, let's not give up, let's keep on going for Jesus. That's pretty good stuff, isn't it? I don't even have that in my notes, I don't know where it comes from. I want to encourage you. Friend, as a child of the living God, we've got it made. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Children don't have it easy. They fall, they stumble, they get bruised, they have difficulties, but they overcome. Isn't it amazing how God makes things? I was telling my daughter yesterday, she said that the, my little grandson almost fell. And I said, but if he does, he don't fall but this far. I'm six foot. If I fall, I fall a long ways down. And my bones got older and brittle, and, and you don't recover nearly as fast. But we're more mature. We learn to walk slower. Grab hold of something. Take somebody down with you that's fluffy. <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> Just a thought. Be an overcomer, <laughs> be victorious. Oh, we got it made in Jesus, friends. This is a short time in eternity span, and we're just passing through this old world. And John wanted to write to the children. He wanted to write to the fathers, and he wanted to write to the young men, and he wanted to encourage them. And I want to encourage you today. And first, I want to encourage you that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know that you can. Right now, today, right where you're sitting, you can know Jesus Christ in the fullness of his glory. And all you have to do is realize that you're a sinner. 
And because of your personal sins, not sins of anyone else or the world, but because of your personal sins, you're damned to hell because of your sins. But God understood that. And because of his wonderful love, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be a propitiation, a sin sacrifice for us. And that if you would trust in him for your salvation and give your life to him and say, Lord Jesus, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Save me. He says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He'll save you instantaneously. You don't have to understand the Bible. Why? Because you're an unbeliever. You don't have to understand it all. Why? Because instantly when you get saved, you're a baby. Baby doesn't understand everything. But there are certain things you, need, you can understand. One is that your sins are forgiven. And two is that you can really know him in his fullness and glory. You can know him as your protector, as your Lord and your God. For those who are fathers, those who are older, spiritual, mature, we need to understand. And I want to encourage you that you can know him. And your relationship can get sweeter and sweeter by better knowing him in your life. You can know him. Your relationship can grow by getting to know him better. Just because we become a Christian, we don't shut the book and stop knowing God. I want to know him. His word teaches me about him, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about my life. I want to get all I can get because it remains in me. It lives in me. And we're to encourage each other. We're to encourage each other in our walk in Christ. We're to bear each other's burdens. We're to encourage each other in our journey of life. Friends, it's tough in this world today. And sometimes our brothers and our sisters are beaten down. And maybe we need to be the, the Barnabas in their life. And if you know about Barnabas who became a missionary, he is called the son of consolation, the encourager. Isn't it good just to go put your arm around someone and tell them you love them? Praying for you today, thinking about you. What can I do to help? What's going on? That's a whole lot better than someone comes saying, you know, I don't, everything's falling apart. Nobody loves anybody. The place is going to heck in a handbasket. We hear that every day. We see it on the news. We see it in the newspaper. We need to be encouragers. That's what John was doing. He was encouraging the babies. He was encouraging the young. He was encouraging the spiritually mature. We got it all in Jesus Christ. But if you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, you've got the worst of the worst facing you. It's called hell. This morning, don't let that be. Let me encourage you. Give your life to Christ. And if you are a believer, no matter if you're a baby in Christ, and listen, you can be a 70-year-old baby. You can be in a church your whole life and never grew to grow to spiritual maturity because you're not feasting on the Word of God. You're missing so much. Grow your relationship to Christ by growing in Christ. Let us pray.